Let's get started. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the CHIP Landmark Ideas series. Today, we'll be hearing about medical reversal, why 46% of what doctors think is wrong. And we are very privileged to have with us today Vinay Prasad from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm Ken Mandel. I direct the Computational Health Informatics Program here at Boston Children's Hospital. CHIP was founded in 1994. We're a multidisciplinary applied research and education program. You can learn more about us at www.chip.org. The Landmark Idea Series is an event series featuring thought leaders across healthcare, informatics, IT, big science, innovation, and more. If you want to follow along on Twitter, here are some Twitter handles uh, for Vinay and Chip. Very briefly, the structure of this afternoon will be an introduction to Vinay and then um, his presentation. You may put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box as we go, and we'll have some uh, active discussion and closing remarks. Vinay Prasad is a hematologist oncologist. He's an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. He runs the VK Prasad Lab at UCSF, which studies cancer drugs, health policy, clinical trials, and better decision-making. He is author of over 350 academic articles and the books, Ending Medical Reversal, and Malignant. He hosts the Oncology Podcast Plenary Session, is active on Substack, and runs a YouTube channel. He always offers a fresh perspective. He follows the data wherever it leads. He will call it as he sees it, if he sees conclusions and policy that are not supported by the evidence. He's a prolific writer. He's a deep thinker. If you read or listen to, Vin to Vinay, you no doubt uh, have been moved outside your comfort zone, at least from time to time. Today's talk will be provocative and informative. It could even border on controversial. In any case, I have no doubt it will be entertaining and educational. And it's my great pleasure to turn the screen over to Vinay. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Mandel. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. and. Um... If anyone can't hear me, let me know, put it in the chat. But um, it's my distinct pleasure to get to talk to you all this, uh, this afternoon about medical reversals. And I'm gonna try to build the uh, somewhat provocative case that 46% of what doctors think is wrong. I could have put 46.2%, but you know, I hope not to persuade you of the specific number, but rather the sentiment that a good chunk of what we do in biomedicine probably doesn't actually accomplish what we wish it did or what we hope it accomplishes. And um, you may quibble with the exact number by the end of it, but that's okay as long as we agree on the sentiment. Um, a lot of this will come from a paper we published a couple of years ago in eLife, which was really about medical reversals. And so I encourage you all to check this out um, if you're interested by this talk. So what is medical reversal? I think many of us, when we conceptualize biomedicine, we naturally think about biomedicine as analogous to domains we have a lot more experience with such as the automobile or telephone or electronics. Right here, I show you a picture of the Model T, Henry Ford's Model T, and then the Tesla Model S. Um, I think when it comes to automobiles, we've had sort of slow, steady, incremental progress. The automobiles we have today, they can travel further, they're more fuel efficient, they're much safer than they once were. Um, it's, it's simply a better vehicle. And I think many of us think about the same thing with our phones. You know, The phone in my pocket can now do more than the first computer I owned. Uh, the TV on the wall is uh, remarkably better than the first TV I ever had. When we think about technology, we see slow, steady, incremental, and uh, insatiable advancement. And I think we analogize biomedicine as if it's the same thing, as if we've had you know, the same sort of steady progress. And I think part of that is true. I mean, that is a true narrative in biomedicine. We've had many things that are just incremental advances. You know, It wasn't that long ago, maybe just over a half century, where the thinking around peptic ulcer disease was no acid, no ulcer. This was a disease driven by acid formation, inappropriate acid formation in the stomach. 
And the techniques we had at that time by modern standards are quite barbaric. Um, extensive surgeries like Bill Roth and Bill Roth II to sort of resect the stomach and prevent um, the nerves from feeding the stomach that actually increase acid secretion. Finally, we got wise to the role of histamine antagonists, the pills like Pepsid that suppressed stomach acids, although transiently it has tachyphylaxis, it wears off. And then we moved to proton pump inhibitors, which is a more durable way to inhibit uh, stomach uh, pH. And then finally with Barry Marshall and his ultimate Nobel Prize winning work, we realized that there is the important causative organism of H. pylori and we moved to quadruple therapy of antibiotics. So the story of how we treat peptic ulcer disease came, went from barbaric surgery to a handful of pills you take for a short period of time. And that is a remarkable progress, I think, in biomedicine. The other example I think of is in my field, in cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, I was reading some books recently and it was as late as World War II that if you were given the diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma, think about that, a 20 year old, uh, potentially a soldier giving that diagnosis, it was thought to be universally fatal in the course of two to four years. Um, Henry Kaplan here in the Bay Area, he pioneered the use of radiotherapy and he was able to achieve cures in the 1950s, although few and far between and, and, and often fleeting. Um, and then it was the folks at the NCI, Vincent DeVita, who used combination chemotherapy, um, things like uh, mustard gas and, and, vin and vincas and prednisone to have mop and mop, which actually had pretty decent cure rates, although at the price of horrific nausea. And then finally, we moved in the 1960s to ABVD, which is a set of chemotherapy drugs that, you know, to this day remains the standard of care. I think the only additional advancement is possibly one drug that's uh, made by Seattle Genetics and maybe better antiemetics. And we took a condition that was thought to be universally fatal, and now we have cure rates about 90%. And I think that is the progress of biomedicine we think about. But what I wish to suggest to you all is that in many other times, Something we have been doing in biomedicine was found to be no better or worse than a prior or lesser standard of care, including doing nothing. These are the missteps in medicine where we implement something. We had you know, the best of intentions, but it didn't go the way we think. And to me, this is a history of medicine that easily gets removed from our textbooks. Because if you sit down to write the textbook of hematology, you're already gonna be writing a few thousand pages. I mean, it's a, it's a big book or internal medicine, thousands of pages. And you need to tell a story. And the story you tell is looking back, what were all the important things that lead up to how we practice medicine today? But naturally that whitewashes the missteps, the falsehoods, the things we did for many years that didn't work. Those are omitted. And so, you know, that classic quote, history is told by the victors. We tell ourselves a story of how we got here. We forget all the times we stumbled. And that's what I want to talk about, medical reversal. This is what doesn't get covered in, in the books. One example. Routine use of the Swan-Gantz catheter. Now this is a catheter invented by Swan and Gantz and you can float it in, 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 into the heart uh, from the venous system. And you can actually blow up a little balloon in this catheter. And if you have a patient in the intensive care unit and they're in shock, low blood pressure for whatever reason, you have difficulty knowing, is it not enough fluids, not enough squeeze on the heart? Is it potentially a septic shock picture? And they have um, diffuse capillary beds. Which of these is it? And this catheter will tell you you know, the, the pressure in the right atria, the right ventricle, potentially the left atria as well through the, the wedge pressure. It'll give you, you could squirt some cold water at the proximal end and measure the temperature at the distal port. And now suddenly you have a metric of cardiac output. You can tell how much the heart is pushing that blood around by the thermodilution. And so it's an incredibly useful thing in the sense it gives you information. Just like we have wearables tracking our everything and just like you can sequence uh, the whole genome of you know, repeat stool samples. You can get lots of information from somebody. The question with information is always, what can you do with the information? Can you leverage it to make better choices? So we were routinely doing this in ICU patients for shock. And then finally we ran randomized control trials to say, does the routine use of this device, which allows you to adjust the medications, improve outcomes? And the answer was it didn't, and that's the escape trial. And it's dramatically fallen out of favor. And it does have some complications. It's not zero, but you can infarct a piece of lung if you leave the balloon up too long. So what's the lesson here? The lesson here is a device that's incredibly useful, gives you real information about the heart. It's the seduction that more information is always better, but we could not use this information to have better outcomes. In fact, you have the same outcomes if you didn't float the swan dance. So medical reversal to me is much more like this. This is the Volkswagen diesel. You know, this is a car that you may have forgotten about, but this was a misstep in automobile engineering. This was a car that my understanding is Volkswagen cooked the books. They made it, if you plugged it into that little test thing, it said that it was the most um, 
uh, greenhouse gas safe car there is. We put the least amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But of course, it was a glitch that Volkswagen had built into the electronic system and it was putting out 32 times as much greenhouse gases. So people bought this because they wanted to be environmentalists and it turned out they did a lot more damage. And that to me is a very frequent narrative in biomedicine, uh, far more frequent than technology. And we just don't recognize it because we often don't do the gold standard evidence that allows us to see if that's true. So the definition of medical reversal I'll offer you is uh, when a large, well-done study, typically a randomized controlled trial, contradicts current medical practice. And for a lot of the work we do, you may ask specifically, what are we looking at? We're typically looking for a study where I can, with some confidence, say that this single study is better than the totality of the prior evidence. And we've actually done some things that I hope will persuade you of that. The study has better blinding, better control, better power, better endpoints. One study is better than the thing that led up to adoption because what led to adoption is often pathophysiologic rationale, retrospective studies, maybe case series, very limited levels of evidence. So we'll talk about that. The first question you might have. Many years ago, I gave this talk and somebody said, look, you know, it's like an earthquake in California. You remember every earthquake in California, but there's still a rare event. That's what a reversal is. You know, it's memorable, but it's overblown in your mind because you're focusing on the reversals. But, you know, somebody else told me it's not like that. It's like a snowstorm in a Chicago winter, which is it's, it's in your mind a lot because it's happening all the time. So which is it? How often does it happen? We sought to estimate it. And this is by no means a perfect estimate, but it is one estimate. So what we did, we took every original article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in a decade. That was 2,044 articles. And every single article was read in duplicate and coded by a series of metrics. And that's why God invented medical students, to do this kind of hard hitting, impactful work. The first thing we found was that two thirds of those articles actually concerned a medical practice. The other third were classic biology articles that could have easily appeared in nature or science, but two thirds were something we were doing in biomedicine. Now, if you're in the New England Journal of Medicine, and if we're something we're doing in biomedicine, the vast majority tested something novel. Is apixaban better than Coumadin? Is ibrutinib better than chlorambucil? Is the new drug better than the old drug? And if you test something novel, and if you're in the New England Journal of Medicine, I'm pretty sure I know what your answer was. Newer is better because 77% of those practices found that the newer intervention was superior. It was a replacement event. We replace what we're doing with something better. 17% found the new practice was no better or worse. And that's what we call back to the drawing board. And I think this represent, represents what people talk about as selective reporting or publication bias. It's really publication bias. You know, to be in the New England Journal of Medicine, to keep that impact factor going ever so high, you really need practice changing things. No one wants to talk about the anticoagulant that never came to market because it won't be cited five years later. But the anticoagulant trial that changed practice will be. And so I think that is their preference and that is the bias there. But we also found about one quarter of the, of the trials that were in the New England Journal were literally testing established medical practices, things that we do day in, day out, like we swab people for multi-drug resistant bacteria, and if they're positive, we institute contact precautions, or we um, give them, uh, we, we lower their A1, A1C to, you know, aiming for a target of seven, uh, rather than a more permissive target. When you test something that we're already doing, only about a third, uh, sorry, 40% of the time they validated the practice. They found that what we were doing actually does what you think it does. But 40% of the time they found that what we were doing is no better or worse than a prior or lesser standard of care. And that's what we call reversal. Now you may say, well, there's a publication bias here too. And that publication bias is for reversals. And I say, I guess I can't argue. I mean, I can't disprove that, but I would suggest that the mere testing of standard of care is provocative. It's highly provocative. It's, it's very rarely occurs in biomedicine, and it will be cited a lot, no matter what it finds. If you validate standard of care, you're going to have a huge citation trail because you'll have a more robust validation of what we're doing. And if you contradict it, you'll have a huge citation trail and the explosive debates that emerge from such a scenario. So I guess what I would suggest is that although it's possible this estimate is skewed to some degree by selection bias, um, I do think it's also less likely to be the case than something totally novel. But we, but we have some other estimates, so we'll see if we can converge on something. You know, I encourage many people to read the supplement of this paper. These are the things that get left out of the textbooks. The things we did in biomedicine that we thought made people live longer, live better, do better, that didn't work. And if you read this, you will see, I think, the true humility of medicine, which was the people who believed in these practices were just as smart and capable and dedicated as we are. And yet they were seduced by something wrong. 
they were seduced by something that turned out not to work. And how did they fall into that trap? And they fall into the trap for the same reasons we continue to fall into that trap to this day. And I think this is, I wish, what you know, the history books conveyed to students, and in part why we wrote a book called Enigmatic Reversal. Um, you know, there is no corner of medicine that is exempt from reversals. We got pills, we got procedures, we got devices, and we even have very complicated things like P2Y12 testing. What do I mean by that? You know, after we stent somebody and put a metal stent in their coronary artery, we give them a drug called Plavix, which is an ADP receptor antagonist to prevent the platelets from aggregating, because we know that that newly placed stent is a site for local thrombus. And when you give them Plavix, it's less likely to aggregate. But of course, some people still have it happen anyway, and they have an instant thrombosis, and that isn't good. And the drug companies have made a number of new medications, second-generation ADP receptor antagonists that are more potent than Plavix. And the idea was, and observational data suggested, that if you give Plavix and you test platelet reactivity, and your reactivity is still highly reactive, you have a problem, and you're more likely to have instant thrombosis and bad outcomes. So those people, probably it's rational to switch to the new drugs that are even more potent than Plavix. And yet they ran a 4,000 person randomized control trial, randomized to the routine platelet reactivity testing or not. In the arm that got the testing, they of course found reactive platelets. And of course they switched them more often to prasagril and ticagrelor. And yet the primary endpoint of the study wasn't do you switch the drug? It's do you improve the clinical outcome? And that trial failed, that's the Arctic study. So we no longer do this. So even something like that, a very complex strategy question, you know, didn't work in a robust randomized control trial. And so that's why I'm skeptical of things like, you know, if we're going to have a White House correspondence dinner, should everyone get testing before? I don't know. It's plausible that that would lower the risk of a break, you know, super spreader event. But it's also possible that just like this, you are seduced by information and you actually can't use it to leverage better outcomes because inevitably some people will still be positive. So let me turn to this paper, Medical Reversals. This was our, you know, for, we had published on this topic and we had received some criticism. And so we tried to address a lot of that criticism in this uh, larger analysis. Let me see in the chat. I just put the questions in the Q&A. I see one. Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so so um, we tried to address some of the concerns. Let's go through it. Um, here we replicated what we've done, except we take more journals, more years, and we're looking at 7,000 articles, and we exclude the big chunk that don't concern medical practice. We take randomized control trials that concern practices, 3,000, um, and we exclude anything that we think is new or truly inconclusive, and we pick the ones um, that we think are true medical reversals. Uh, 300, uh, sorry, this is, I think there's a little typo here. It should be a 420 something. Um, and for every single medical reversal that we find, we actually performed an analysis looking for a systematic review. And if we found a systematic review that contradicted medical practice, uh, uh, we asked ourselves, does it, is it the same as the reversal study? And if the systematic review says the point estimate is still of a benefit, but your, you know, your study is on the bad side of it, we didn't count that as a reversal. We only counted as a reversal if the systematic review showed a pooled point estimate of harm or no benefit, um, or the systematic review just couldn't be done. That one study was literally the only study in a systematic review. It was the only rigorously done study. So we left with a set of 396 practices that we believe are sort of robust reversals. And this is what they, we found. You know, they tend to be uh, high income country studies, much less likely to be low and middle income country studies. And if they are low and middle income, they're gonna be published in The Lancet. And we're talking about procedure, medications and procedures, and also vitamins and supplements and devices and systems interventions, as well as um, you know, behavioral therapies, even screening tests, which we can debate. Um, but these are all things that we did that we thought would make people better off. And yet, I think as we did them, they probably did not achieve that goal. And I guess that's why I call it wrong or incorrect, because as it was implemented, the net societal benefit was probably null or negative, um, and negative if you factor in the cost and toxicity. I'll skip this, this is just by discipline. Um, I'll skip that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this for a second. Yes, we'll talk about the financial part in a second. You'll find that interesting. I mean, you know, many years ago, I think 2011, there was an outbreak in your neck of the woods of um, fungal, fungal meningitis, aspergillus. For people who had uh, painful spinal stenosis and low back pain, they went to the doctor and they had an injection of methylprednisolone 
um, in the epidural space, which is something we do to reduce back pain for spinal, spinal stenosis. And everyone was up in arms because that compounding pharmacy, I think in Connecticut, and I think somebody eventually went to prison, they had contaminated the methylprednisolone with aspergillus and that's why there was the outbreak. And that's not good. Certainly don't condone aspergillus in my methylprednisolone. But the question I had, of course, was why was so many people getting methylprednisolone injected into their epidural space? And presumably the reason you do that is that it makes them feel better than if you didn't do it, but it's actually been put to, put to the test. Oh, here it is. Um, this is what they do. They get you under fluoroscopy and they inject it here and you know that nerves are inflamed and you know this is an potent anti-inflammatory, it's supposed to soothe it. And they mix uh, lidocaine or bupivacaine or some you know, uh, anesthetic with the steroid. And the anesthetic will have a immediate impact, but it will wear off within 36 or 48 hours when the half-life of the anesthetic wears off. But three weeks or six weeks later, the only thing on board should be the steroid and that should be alleviating the pain. And so clever investigators performed a sham controlled randomized study. Met lidocaine plus salt water or lidocaine plus, plus methylprednisolone. And you wouldn't expect to see a difference early on because they're both getting the lidocaine, but at three weeks and six weeks, you should see a big difference if you get methylprednisolone because it's a long acting anti-inflammatory. And this is what they find. One of these lines is the salt water and one of these lines is the glucocorticoid and both are getting the lidocaine. And at three weeks and six weeks, there's just not a lick of difference under any of these scales between the two. But all of the arms suggest, or all of the indices suggest improvement. So people do feel better, yes. The doctor's impression is validated, yes. But they feel better because they're getting an expensive and sometimes contaminated placebo. That's why they feel better. It's a placebo effect. And in fact, um, you know, I think that's well supported now in multiple studies. Um, one more example. Um, there's a subset of people with high blood pressure. And in this group of people with high blood pressure, there can be some that are very difficult to control. Those people often have a narrowing in the renal artery which supplies the blood flow to the kidney. And you might remember the kidney makes uh, all of the hormones that regulate blood pressure, renin, and then it's converted to angiotensin one, and angiotensin two. And if you have a stenotic lesion leading to the kidney, you might have high blood pressure because the kidney feels like it's strangled from oxygen you know, because of the blockage. So you can imagine you open the blood flow, the kidney gets all the blood, the renin drops and the blood pressure comes under control. And indeed this renal artery stenting for high blood pressure um, and renal artery stenosis is incredibly seductive. It makes perfect mechanistic sense. But now in multiple randomized control trials of medical therapy plus or minus renal artery um, stenting, there's no difference in time to renal event, time to cardiovascular event, and even the larger studies showing no difference in pooled event-free survival. Again, very you know, commonly used procedure. There are cardiologists who say it still has a role in the ultra high risk patients. I guess I could say no, no, um, no amount of studies can disprove that it might work in some subgroup, but at some point when you're spending a billion dollars a year of CMS money on an intervention, you have, it behooves you to prove to me in what subgroup it improves outcomes. And I've never seen a positive randomized control trial in a subgroup. So we can assume that it might work for some, but we cannot say it does work for some. And these trials show that it doesn't work for many, and many is who are getting it. Um, I'm going to skip the orbita, although I find that if we have time, we'll talk more about it. You know, why is this a problematic thing? And I do think it's different than the normal ebb and flow in, of science because it's really, you know, it's, it's because we leapt ahead with a policy or uh, medical intervention. We broadly disseminated it before we had gotten robust or credible data, and we didn't have robust or credible data ongoing. I mean, we have one example right now, this Exondis, Exondis 57, this Duchenne's muscular dystrophy drug. It changes the dystrophin protein level a little bit in a cell. Um, one of the reviewers at FDA was skeptical of that. He said it was something like if you were walking out of your front porch in Boston, you had nine inches of snow and you don't trudge through it, this drug sweeps, up, sweeps away one eighth of one inch of snow. And supposedly you're supposed to walk easier as a result. It's hard to believe but that's what the drug does. There's supposed to be confirmatory clinical trials measuring outcomes people care about, mechanical ventilation, disability, death. The company has taken four years to even launch those, you know, those clinical trials. So the drug could go its whole patent life cycle before we ever get credible data that it helps or hurts, we don't know. So of course, I think you know, when you have reversal, people who undergo practices that as they were applied did not work, as they were applied in the real world, they didn't have benefit. Those people I think are harmed, many of which were you know, told that they were gonna have something that helps them and it was sort of incorrect. It was just an, a placebo effect or no effect at all. I think the problem in medicine is that 
and this is something that many policy people will talk about, is that turning around medicine is like turning a battleship. You know, it turns very, very slowly and there's a lag time. Maybe even some studies show a decade before people really de-adopt a contradicted medical practice. But for me, I think, and, and I think the pandemic illustrates some of these themes, the loss of trust is gargantuan. I mean, if you have promulgated and recommended something, and here I'm talking about mammography yearly between women between the ages of 30, you know, 40 and, and 50. I think that's a place where USPSTF has backed off for good reason, going biannually. I think that's always been a space that's been heavily debated. Um, I think some people think it shouldn't be offered in those ages. Some people think it should be biannual. Some people think it should be a choice. But we used to have slogans, literally, that said, if a woman has not had um, if a woman has not had a mammogram, she might need more than her breasts examined. That was an advertisement taken out by the American Cancer Society. So we didn't just try to inform people about this option. We used uninformative persuasion to push them into doing it. And then when we back away from that a few years ago and admit that we might have erred, it leads to huge distrust in the medical system. And I think that distrust is, is sweeping and, 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 and has led to some of the polarization we see. So why does reversal happen? Like, what is the root cause? And in my mind, the root cause is really we adopted something based on inadequate or biased studies. You know, sometimes it's because we did a randomized trial, but that turned out to be erroneous, like recombinant activated protein C or zygris. But most often it's because we adopted things based on very, very low levels of evidence without definitive trials ongoing or forthcoming. You know, sometimes it's pathophysiology alone. Sometimes it's a mannequin study or an anecdote, an anecdote of, um, you know, a mannequin study and the story of what happened in, with, in one classroom in Marin, you know, that's, that's the level of evidence that leads to wide scale adoption. Sometimes it's epidemiologic evidence. And now we have at your institution, people working on target trials, which is supposed to be an advance. Um, I still think it, it runs the real risk of residual confounding. I mean, they have a lot of elegant ways to try to solve that problem, but that's a very difficult problem to solve when the type of people that seek out something are very, very different than the types of people who don't seek it out. Like the person who runs to get the fourth booster on day one is very different than the person who drags their feet in a number of other ways. And it's very, very difficult to parse that. And few data sets have all the other sort of covariate data you would need to undo that confounding. Historical controlled evidence in my field of cancer, we treat 50 people and then we say they're doing better than they did in 19 diggity two, ergo it's better, you know, notoriously upwardly biased. And then randomized trials, I think we don't talk enough about, but I try to do it on my podcast plenary session and in my second book, Malignant. Um, you know, randomized trials, just because you're randomized doesn't mean you're good. Um, you know, inappropriate populations, we're studying people that are just so unrepresentative from our clinics, inappropriate dosing, we'll have a paper out on that soon, you know, straw man comparators, limitations on concomitant medication use, we'll do an asthma study, but you're not allowed to take many classes of drugs that have already proven benefit, it's problematic. Um, for a um, for quality and safety metric, it's done in a single center, um, which really makes you prone to the unique idiosyncrasies of the investigators there. Drug run-in period, if we have time, I'll give you an example. Inappropriate endpoints where it's seduced by surrogates, um, early termination, selective reporting and publication bias. And then finally, meta-analysis. You know, I like to say meta-analysis is like a juicer. It only tastes as good as what you put in that juicer. We're putting a lot of rotten fruits and vegetables in that juicer. So I just want to show you one thing that I think you'll find interesting. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an editorial we wrote about a really interesting paper, and I'm going to talk about the paper. I should have put the paper as a slide, so I apologize. I shouldn't put the editorial. Anyway, I'll talk about the paper. The paper was something very clever. The authors took um, National Comprehensive Cancer Network cancer guidelines, and they picked 191 recommendations that were supported or contradicted by a randomized trial. Like, do this or don't do this, and here's the RCT data to justify that claim, and that's the guidelines. And then for each of those studies, they performed, I think, a pretty good um, a propensity score weighted um, observational study. I mean, is it the best observational study? No, but is it on par with an observational study you might see in the literature? Absolutely. And they did this for 191 studies. So good kudos to them to publish it in one study and rather than 191 papers and then this study. So they, so, but it's very nice because now we can compare the two. Observational study, randomized trial, same clinical question, same clinical question. And the clinical question is really sort of a dichotomous clinical question, which is, do I treat this person or don't I? And here's what we found in the randomized data. Let me double check that. No, 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 sorry. Observational data. In the observational data, 55% of those observational studies that they performed 
validated the practice. They said like, yes, this works. This improves outcomes. You ought to do it in cancer. 45% didn't. They said, no, it doesn't. No difference or worse outcomes. Don't do it. If you found the practice beneficial in the randomized control trial that was only validated 40% of the time, but most often, you know, 60% of that time, it was contradicted by the randomized study. There was no benefit. And if you found the practice had no benefit, then 67% of the time the randomized trial validated that. It also found no benefit. And the rest were this, you know, 67, oh, the numbers are a little bit off, I need to fix that. Um, but you see the, the visually, you see it. Okay, so what's the net result? I move the, va I move the green over. Green means it works, orange means it doesn't work. And here it means it works, and here it doesn't work. And I think the answer is clear. There is an upward bias in observational studies, at least for cancer clinical questions. It's much more likely to find that it works than in randomized control trials. Now, you might say that's an issue of power, but you know, um, in cancer medicine, we've done a very good job of cranking up our sample size until we can find the power to detect a seven-day difference in survival. That's not even an exaggeration. We do power our studies uh, immensely for looking for trivial differences because that makes us all rich. Um, but I think it's a fundamental bias that is coded in the data set, which is that in the doctor's eyeball, for a doctor to do something, you are not going to do it on the most frail or vulnerable patient. You're going to do it on someone who you think can take it, especially if what you're doing is in toxic, invasive surgery or radiotherapy or drug. You don't give it to someone who looks like they're very frail or vulnerable. You give it to someone who looks in your eyeball like it's worth a shot, that they can try it, even if you don't have great data. And that bias, that's a confounding by indication bias. It's confounded by me thinking they're up for it. And that bias will always result in the fact that observational studies will look better, even if what's along for the ride is salt water, because I'm picking people who look better to give the thing that's more aggressive. And I think that's the core bias. And that's why randomized trials, obviously it undoes that bias because nobody's picking or choosing. It's randomly assigned. One thirty-four. Okay, I will do one more example. And um, well, I guess I have an example of Entresto. That's one. I have some parachute stuff. Uh, I'll do the Entresto, and then I'll save the parachutes for maybe for a discussion. I mean, this is a drug. This is a blockbuster drug. Entresto, Secubitril Valsartan. It's a Novartis product. It's selling a lot of money. Um, but it's the only Secubitril. It's the only Bitril I hear about. I think it's, it's a very interesting study. So let me walk you through. You know, it's a randomized control trial of, um, oh, okay, it's a randomized control trial of a new drug, Secubitril, which is an inhibitor of nephrolysin, which is involved in the body's fluid cascade. And they pair that with an angiotensin receptor blocker, Valsartan, which is 160 milligrams BID. And they test themselves against enalapril, 10 milligrams BID. And this is in New York Heart 2, 3, and a little bit of 4, but mostly 2, 3, heart failure. This is a standard of care, and this is a standard of care, kind of. And this is the new drug that has a long patent life. And the first thing I notice when I see this randomized trial is it's drug A plus B versus drug C. And to me, that's a little bit odd because it doesn't isolate the effect of the new drug. I mean, it's kind of fact, like which, if Valsartan 160 is better than this, that could drive the whole effect. So how can I tell? But this is the way the study was designed. And the next thing it has, it has a double drug running period. You take, oh, okay. I should have put my other slides. Um, so what do they do? They take people with New York Heart 23 heart failure, 10,000 people, and they're all on an ACE or an ARB, which is the standard of care for heart failure at baseline. And they say, stop taking those drugs and take enalapril 10 milligrams BID, which by the way, is the 50% maximal FDA approved dose. You can give 20 BID, but they're giving 10 BID. So it's half the max dose. You take that for 14 days. And in those 14 days, sorry, 15 days, a thousand people fall off your study. I mean, you're losing one in 10 people in your study. They drop out, they can't take it, they're in, in, intolerant to it, they have an event, they're out. And then whoever remains, 9,000 9, people, they're randomized to take Secubitril Valsartan. For the first 14 days, they take Valsartan 80 milligrams BID, which is the half maximal dose of Valsartan. But in the next 14 days, they crank up the Valsartan to 160 BID, which is really an unthinkable dose. In my practice, I've never gotten anyone at that high a dose. They crank it up for the next 14 days. So they have twice as long on their study drug. And then, and only then, do they randomize. Whoever, and another thousand people fall out of the study. So we've lost 2,000 people by the time you get to randomization. And 
remember, all the data is only counted from the moment of randomization. So when you randomize, you're randomized to continue taking on Tuesday the same drug you took on Monday. That's what we call the experimental arm. And the control arm is you switch to a drug you hadn't taken in a month that uses a 50% dose of RAS inhibition, whereas this used a 100% dose of RAS inhibition. So it's a different drug. Um, in my mind, this design is so problematic. One, I don't know if Sacubitril adds anything. This is a higher dose than this. Every time you, the longer you run in on a, tri, on a trial, you idiosyncratically remove people intolerant to the medication and you favor the arm that has the longer run in. And then the final point is that anybody who switches in heart failure, there will be a fraction of people who have events merely by switching, and that will only occur on the control arm, not the intervention arm in this study. So the control arm will pay the penalty. So I think, you know, this trial tests a very weird question, which is, is it better to stay on Entresto or switch to enalapril after exposure to both agents for unequal periods of time? But it doesn't answer the question that I have in my doctor's office, which is if I have a patient on an ACE or an ARB, is it better to switch to Entresto or just try to increase the dose of their drug? When I read this study, I was reminded of an older study that said the, ACE, the dose of an ACE or an ARB is important and improves outcomes the higher you push that dose. And I asked myself, you know, by chance alone, since an allopro, you could have taken a higher dose before you enrolled in the trial, but the trial capped you out at 10 twice a day. Somebody got to be taking a higher dose at baseline. What percent was that? And the answer was it was buried in the supplement, the mean dose and the standard deviation. And so, of course, I constructed a normal distribution. And I said, you know, it could be as high as one in three people. We're actually taking a higher dose than the maximally prescribed dose of this trial. And that's a problem. That means they could have tolerated a higher dose and they're artificially being um, uh, limited uh, by the control arm. Uh, but um, somebody wrote to me and they said the problem for this analysis is it doesn't account uh, the pill size. The pills are partitioned in five milligram equivalents, so it's not a continuous variable. And they actually performed this analysis for the pill size. And the number they got was about 16%. Um, and the equation they used was literally so long and it fits across four slides. So that's why I, I usually include it, but I forgot to put that slide in. Um, so good for that. Uh, but my point is that it's not 0%. And that means that this control arm is very problematic. It's beneath what you were getting when you enrolled. Um, I had Rosa on, who's now an uh, intern at MGH, Mass General Hospital in uh, psychiatry, um, and a brilliant researcher, I asked her to look into this issue, and, and I asked her to pull every single cardiology approval in a decade, about 46 drugs, 141 trials supporting approval, and I said, you know, tell me about these trials. How often is it drug versus placebo? Of course, that's the lion's share. Drug A versus B, you know, a big chunk. Of course, that makes sense. Um, drug A plus B versus A versus B, yeah, that's great. You isolate the effect of A and B, and then the synergy, beautiful. I love that study. What about A plus B versus C? And that is this trial. And it's the only, it's only one of two. And the other one, people may not remember, but it's uh, isosorbide hydralazine Bidil, which eventually received FDA approval in self-defined African-Americans, but only after a confirmatory study. Um, but that wasn't required here. And to me, this is really unique. It's a single trial leading to regulatory approval um, with a very unique design. And, um, you know, no surprise since this study, um, you know, we've had the LIFE RCT negative, Paragon negative. I mean, this drug has had a bunch of negative trials. And then the other thing I like to say is that the other blockbuster class of drugs in heart failure is empagliflozin. And I swear, every time I open the New England Journal, I see empagliflozin, depagliflozin, flozin, flozin, flozin. I see all these flozins, but I never see a bitril. I see secubitril, but no other bitrils. Only one bitril, but so many flozins. And that to me also speaks to the fact that is it really an efficacious drug or is it a unique mm, con, uh, uh, alignment of these sort of trial factors that lead to the, the benefit scene? So I will um, stop for some questions in a minute and have a broader discussion. I guess what I think the problem is here, and this is actually, you know, the predominant disagreement I have with sort of pandemic management is I have no disagreement that when a situation is dire and unprecedented, you should be able to take unprecedented actions in response in the heat of the moment. No doubt about it. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a mouse during the initial school closure and the initial lockdown, and I'm a mouse very quiet for a new drug being approved in metastatic melanoma, for instance, based on response rate. I'm, I'm, a, I'm quiet about that. I'm okay with that. But my question is, how long do you continue an intervention without even trying to generate credible data. You know, you want two-year-olds to mask? Okay, we'll run a randomized trial while you're doing it. But when you get to year two or year three, 
shouldn't we as a scientific community ask ourselves, why do we continue to hang our hat on unreliable data, low qualities of data? We should ask ourselves that because we should know the history of medicine is when people, smart people, well-motivated people hang their hat on such data, they are often wrong. And so in my mind, you know, because it's so difficult to test things once they're on the market, you know, new costly technologies that are being introduced into healthcare systems are ideal for testing at launch. And there's now a provision that's pending legislative action that says the FDA can mandate that the company have the confirmatory trial enrolled when they give the accelerated approval. That to me is a step up because we have to be able to tell our patients that at some point in the life cycle of a product, we are going to get evidence that really settles this issue. Do you or do you not live longer or live better by using this product and antibody titers and tumor scan measurements and LDL cholesterol, that's not the measure that people care about. They care about living longer and living better in a clean, robust study. And maybe someday we can use target trials, but you know, I think they have some more validation to do. For now, they have to do randomized trials. And you know, that's why I feel like when you get to year three and you're still saying we need to mask a two-year-old, I ask myself, you know, why do you not do a cluster randomized trial to persuade me that it actually does something? Um, and I think it's a similar principle. We need to prioritize unproven medical practice. And I think there's a huge chunk of medical practice that we just don't know. Every day you go on wards, you're repleting potassium. D does that improve outcomes? Doesn't it? You need to replete magnesium, doesn't it? If you think about all the things you're doing for a patient in front of you, you will conclude, and there's data to support, maybe 50% of those things you just can't find any data at all. You do it because the person who taught you medicine, who you honor and revere, did that. And that's why you do it. But you don't do it because you have any proof that it helps. And we need to sort of stratify those things. And the things I would prioritize are cost, invasiveness, toxicity. Those things should be preferentially tested. Budgetary impact should go up. The number of people impacted by it. Um, the, the preferences of society where people are polarized or have strong values and preferences. I think that prioritizes something. Um, the use of unprecedented powers or coercive powers. I think that prioritizes stuff. And that's how you would prioritize. If you're mandating something, you need better evidence than if you merely offer it, I think. And if it has a $12 billion budgetary impact, it needs better evidence than something that's you know, $10 million. And so I think we need to think through the huge swaths of unproven medicine and subject it to a large non-conflicted trials agenda. Um, you know, we spend a pittance of what we spend on healthcare in testing healthcare. Um, we spend trillion dollars on healthcare at the federal level. Why don't we spend 5% of healthcare spending on testing the billions of dollars of healthcare spending to see if it actually works or benefits people, or if it's merely just a financial product that rearranges money. And then I do think that the design and conduct of clinical trials needs to someday move to third parties. You know, if I make Entresto, of course, I'm going to take Secubitril, my new drug, and pair it with max dose Valsartan. And of course, I'm going to go up against half dose Enalapril. And of course, I'm going to do a double drug run in of unequal periods of time. And my drug goes second because that's the place you want to be. And my drug has twice as long and you dose escalate my drug and then you switch to the control arm. Of course, I will do that because all those things favor me getting a win. And the only way to run a clean study is if the person designing it is really impartial and trying to find the truth and not trying to get a win. Um, but our current system is not designed that way to talk about. This is a big objection, but I'll save it for questions. If you want to know, we've done a lot of work on parachutes, um, but I will stop and I will see where you want to take this discussion and try to do the Q and A. Vinay, that's fantastic. Do you want to do you want to talk about parachutes for a minute? We have we, you know, I don't want to. Let me answer some of the questions and then we'll kind yeah. of if people right. want to do it, we'll let, do it. Yeah. Let, let me let me start yeah. with one question, and I want to jump off of uh, actually what you last discussed this this um, theoretical third party uh, trial organization. Yes. Now, that, since that doesn't exist, as you pointed out. Correct. If you were um, designing a big system, the capital S system, whose responsibility is it to get this confirmatory evidence? Is it always the manufacturer or is it also the health system that's prescribing and charging for the care? Uh, is it the payer who has, at, le at the very least, a financial interest in understanding the efficacy? Um, is it some new third party um, market uh, for getting these things? That ha where does that responsibility lie and why does it? Because right now, uh, it obviously falls between the cracks. Yes. 
Well, that's a great question. And I guess I would say that, you know, I've always said that, um, you know, I, I, ultimately, I don't think it's the responsibility of the industry, although that they are tasked with doing it. I don't think it's their responsibility because, you know, the tiger will be a tiger. It's up to us to put the tiger in the cage, you know, and, and, the, and I don't blame the industry. The industry's goal is profit maximization. And so their goal and incentive will be to delay and push, push these things to the limit. The real people who need this data are all of us, the people who pay the tax bill and we're spending, you know, trillion plus in federal expenditure on healthcare. I think private insurers are not going to do this. Ever since Affordable Care Act capitated the profit on revenue at 20%, it changes the incentive structure in private insurance. I know there are a lot of people and a lot of memes where people make it out that insurance's goal is to um, curtail medical spending so they make more profit. But of course, they can only make 20% profit no matter how much they spend. And so if I tell you we're going out to dinner and we're going to eat pizza and you're really hungry and you can only eat 20% of the pizza, what size pizza should I buy? The answer is extra, extra large. And that's what insurers do. I mean, when you work with insurers, they have a huge incentive to manage budgetary changes year to year to make sure premium growth is predicted and not outpaced by anybody else in the market. But the long-term horizon for insurance is that we should spend 40% of GDP on healthcare or 50% or 60, it doesn't matter because that's more pizza in my belly. So I think insurers are not gonna do it, especially the way we've incentivized them. I think it should be CMS. Um, CMS has some regulatory authority with coverage with evidence development only to pay for things in the confines of a randomized control trial. They could do it. Um, and, and I think we could potentially have huge savings. I mean, one, um, you know, one stent that, that CMS is spending 15 billion and they run a hundred million dollar randomized control trial, you know, that's 15 billion savings for potentially many, many years to come. Um, uh, and I think that that's the place I would put it. I would put it between CMS and maybe even wedded to FDA a little bit tighter so that if the trial fails to accrue, automatically revoking the product. Um, but it really falls on all of us, I think, those of us who pay the bill um, to generate the evidence, I think. We're the ones who will benefit the most. Let me ask you one more question and then let's go to the many questions that have come our way from the participants. You know, there's, you, you got at uh, American Cancer Society and U.S. Preventive Task Force and mammography. Um, there are obviously, everyone has an objective uh, that's somewhat um, self-centered. Uh, organizations, no less than, um, than uh, for-profit companies, uh, et cetera, no less than uh, clinicians and, and hospitals that are driving care. And many of those incentives are, are financial, but also success. People want to be successful. Where, how, how do we balance those, um, those various incentives in this system that we're all um, uh, engaging in? Every organization is going to still have a perspective on what outcomes are going to be best for that organization. Um, even if they're trying to act selflessly and in the public interest? Yeah, well, you're asking, I think, one of the greatest questions of our life, really, which is that, you know, there's several levels of bias. We talk so much about the pharmaceutical bias because they sell more product, they get more money. There's a second level of bias, which is, you know, no offense to that, but the urologist society likes PSA screening because it's good for the society and it grows the number of urologists we need. And the cancer society, you know, they obviously want to prevent cancer deaths. I don't, I'm sure they want to do that, but they also doesn't hurt to find a lot more cancer that makes cancer a salient issue that gets more funding. So if I put every lung smoker in a CT scan every two weeks and extrapolate far beyond NLST and, and Nelson and say there's an OS benefit when there isn't, you know, I can do all those things and beef it up. Um, and then I think there's the, the deepest bias, which you talk about, which is we're all brought up in a, in a culture of science, myself included, that when you read books as a little kid, it's the stories of the, of the heroes who discovered things, the, hero, the, the heroic science. We're all discovering things all the time. You know, we're all finding breakthroughs. The, great, the better you are, the more breakthroughs you find. Um, but then you, know, you do science and you realize that the smartest people are the ones who never found a breakthrough. And the people who find breakthroughs are also smart, but they also got lucky. And breakthroughs are few and far between. But somebody crying breakthrough is uh, every single day on the news. And, and I don't have the, the perfect answer for that. And I think maybe I saw Jeff Flyer on this and other thoughtful people have thought about this, but you know, the institutions need new incentives. We all know when we write a grant, um, you know, that if you, if you read a grant, I mean, even your own mother would be sickened by that grant, how much you, you upsell yourself and talk about all the things you'll accomplish. You know, your own mother will say that that's a, you know, you're overselling it, but that's how we're trained to do it, to get the funding, to keep our labs growing. 
And I think we need a system where we are allowed to be more honest about the reality. Um, and the last thing I'd say is the public, I think the public needs to know that the reason you fund science isn't because we find cures every minute, it's because it's hard, but it's the only way to have progress. And the alternative is bleak and dismal and no progress. And so I think you fund science and you fund it a lot more than you do, um, but you should expect less in the short term, but maybe more in the long run. Great. Let me, let me jump into a couple of these questions. Um, and of course, if there's favorite ones you have here, um, point of, like, you'll jump in. Here's one from Blackford Middleton, who's a leader in biomedical informatics for many decades. And it's very nuanced. Um, just curious, given the public mistrust of science these days and the politicization of information, shouldn't we underscore the evolutionary and progressive nature of discovery rather than somewhat inflammatory terms like wrong and reversal? Look forward to your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair point. And I guess what I would say is I just separate two domains. I think there's science and then there's things that we reimburse for. So science, of course, is something where we are always sort of blindly grasping at the truth and the truth may always sort of evade us and there's always changes in nuance. And then I think there's the things we reimburse for. And um, the reason I call it a reversal is we literally, you know, we reimbursed for something, a lot of money, a lot of years, and it just didn't do what you thought it did. And, and that to me feels different than the natural ebb and flow of science. It feels like a very sort of human endeavor of what we sort of fund and pay for. And, um, and I do think it's, it, is, it is abrupt and brisk for people who've experienced it. You know, if you've had a stent uh, pre-courage uh, for a lesion that you didn't need, and then you may have even had an instant thrombosis or some complication, and then one month later you read this study and they say, that doctor told me I'd live longer and it doesn't, it's not even true. Um, you know, I think that's problematic. And, um, you know, of course there's some, there's even a nice BMJ paper where they literally audio taped people consenting to that procedure and show that they, they didn't correct the patient's misconception about what they were signing up for. So that to me, I think feels a little bit different. Um, um, but, you know, I, I agree that, I mean, I think we all agree that there's a public mistrust problem. And I think different people point the finger in different ways. The way I see most frequently pointed is the mistrust problem is those people, you know, the people who go on those terrible podcasts and say nonsense and they're the problem. And of course, I listen to what they say, it often doesn't make a lick of sense. So yes, okay, you know, I'm not a fan of those people, but there will always be a fringe element. The real question is when we as institutions and as um, people who harness the powers of government and universities, when we make proclamations and guidances under our auspices, do we hold ourselves to a very high standard? And when we don't, I think that leads to mistrust in a very deep way. And we can't demand, there'll always be some person on social media saying something wrong. It'll, for as long as there are people, there'll be somebody there, but at least we can say the university can aspire to have better standards. And I think that that's the place where people look for. It. And I think the real mistrust was the errors of institutions. Great. Here's one from Charlotte, please. Um, another consideration is the quality of controls, including placebos in RCTs. How placebos are conceived can undermine blinding, potentially leading to exaggerated reporting of treatment effect sizes. Interested in your comments on that? Yeah, I mean, great literature on this. I mean, one thought is like SSRIs, of course, might make you feel better from your depression, but it also gives you like a metallic taste in the mouth. And that might remind you that you shouldn't feel depressed. So how do you separate the two? And there's a whole literature on active placebo, a placebo that gives you the metallic taste, but doesn't have the, the, the psychoactive ingredient. Does that work? And then I think the most rich literature is around like sham controlled studies. So, um, you know, stenting you versus not stenting you may improve your angina, but is it the knowledge of the stenting or not? And um, in one trial, uh, they did do a sham controlled stenting and there was still a little difference, but it was much smaller than prior um, studies. But my question was always, um, how do you separate the fact that the patient can still kind of smell the sham stent? You're not in there as long, you're not monkeying around as much versus the effect of the stent. And we've written some papers using like idea that we have a third party videotape it and score it is it like, how blind is it? Um, but of course, if the stent actually makes you feel better, it will unblind itself by the symptom reduction. So you need a way to tease those two apart. But I think it's the, it's the richest part, which is, I mean, for anything with a subjective endpoint, the quality of the placebo is very important. For things with an objective endpoint, the placebo is important to some degree if it leads doctors to make other healthcare choices differently. And I think those are sort of two different domains, but uh, you know, I can direct you to some literature there. Here's, uh, you may have thought about less, I don't know. 
I'll ask it because we think about it a lot here and even your off the cuff answer would be interesting. It's from Robert Gurdley and he says, the electronic health record is a major uh, technology that entered medical practices in the last 18 years. So far, no benefits to physicians or patients have been demonstrated. Um, is that something that's at risk of a reversal? Well, to be a reversal, you'll ever have to test it. And I think Epic has <laughs> sunk its tentacles so deep into us, it'll never be tested. But I guess, you know, this is a tough audience to make this point, but I think we'll all agree there are tremendous benefits to the electronic record for those of us who like to study data because we get a lot of data. But I, as somebody who you know runs two clinics and attends on service 14 weeks a year, I will be the first to admit that you know there are a lot of frustrations. And even though I'm young, I, I was at University of Chicago when we still had paper records, and I remember some of that. And I guess I would say that you know maybe 50 years from now, obviously the way we fell into electronic medical records was. Uh, Affordable Care Act incentivized it heavily and a lot of sort of legislation incentivized it and put a lot of incentive behind it. And it was an opportunity, I think a missed opportunity, but we could have tried to see, um, you know, which of the elements are actually improve the, the productivity, the workflow, the patient care, and which ones might be excessive or burdensome. Um, and we missed that sort of on entry. Um, I think it's possible that people will do good studies for parts of the EMR, but, uh, you know, a true EMR versus paper chart, I don't think we'll ever see in our lives again. I think the paper chart has literally been burned. Um, but, I mean, the point is well taken, especially as from the user standpoint. Um, I curse more than I really do. You, uh, if I'm in that, you know, it would just when me and Epic, it's nothing but swear words because I really get frustrated. It's, it's not intuitive for me. <laughs> All right, so I'm seeing in these questions and comments, uh, first of all, enthusiasm about hearing from you about parachutes. And also, I think uh, from one uh, of our participants, I think um, the assumption that parachute is referring to something metaphorical and not the actual parachute itself. So if you're willing, um, we'd love to hear a bit about parachutes. Yeah, okay. So um, I guess one thing I'd say is that like, any time in biomedicine you come along and you say, hey, we need a randomized control trial of something that people generally feel strongly about, they're gonna say, look, look, buddy, you don't, you wanna jump out of an airplane with or without a parachute, or are you you're pretty clear that that works? And the answer is, you don't need to do a randomized trial of that intervention, because if you fall out of an airplane without a parachute, I've read there's only a few case reports of people surviving. Um, if you fall out of an airplane with the parachute, I think the survival rate is like, um, there's less than like seven deaths per 10 million jumps according to the National Parachuting Association. So we're talking about like an absolute risk reduction of death over 15 minutes or five minutes of 99.99993, you know, huge effect size. And many years ago, Gordon Smith and Jill Pell wrote this article in the BMJ, parachute used to prevent death or major trauma, a review of the randomized trials. And then they say, there's no randomized data. So you evidence-based purists like Dr. Prasad would say, quote, we think everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonist of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind randomized placebo crossover trial. They had to do the crossover, crossover <laughs> trial of the parachute. They want to finish us off. Um, look, very funny, and it's been cited 1,200, 1,300 times in the literature, but is it relevant for biomedicine? You know, do we have, are we in the 99.9% .9 effect size business? Is that the business I'm in? I wish I were in that business, but you know, I'm a cancer doctor, so am I in that business? One point I wanna make is that um, this philosopher of science, John Worrell, he had written extensively in the early 2000s that appendectomy versus antibiotics would quote, never be studied in a randomized trial. It was a parachute. But by 2012, we had at least four randomized control trials. And I think they still support appendectomy, but there clearly is a subpopulation that benefit from um, uh, antibiotics alone. So prior parachutes, I think were no such thing. I think the next paper I always cite is uh, an elegant paper by Tiago Pereira, Ralph Horwitz, um, who many of you may know, and John Yonides at Stanford. And um, a very clever paper of the Cochrane database. They basically pulled out every single, single randomized control trial where it had a very large treatment effect defined as odds ratio five or greater. And they plot that on one axis, the index trial, which is uh, the X axis. And then they plot the odds ratio for the random effects meta-analysis on the Y axis. And this is the one-to-one -one line. And what they show is that like when individual studies have massive odds, uh, massive benefits, those benefits are almost always diminished in pooled data, which makes sense, you know, sort of a regression to the true effect size. Um, 
And they only found one study, an entire Cochrane database of an intervention with a large consistent effect on mortality, which was ECMO for neonates. And the absolute risk reduction, we're talking about 40 percentage points, which is huge, but it's not 99.9. And then, um, you know, Paul, Paul and colleague Paul Glasio from Australia, they keep a list of things that we've adopted in biomedicine without randomized trials. And this list is big. I mean, I got this email a few, few years ago. It's like 400 things now, um, you know, and these are true things. Like we never did a randomized trial for this. And yet we all, I think, have belief that it works. Um, but contrast this with like the denominator. We're like at 400, but we do maybe 2 million things in biomedicine. You know, so yeah, maybe there's a few things that are really large effects, but the analogy is misused. And then the last thing I'll show you is um, we pulled every um, reference in that original parachute paper and we read every single one of these. Um, actually, uh, Michael Hayes read every single one of these. And um, the question was like, when people analogize something to a parachute in medicine, are they willing to name names and say like, look, I think my stent is a parachute or I think my pill is a parachute. And only 35 were willing to name names, claim their parachute was a practice their practice was a parachute. When they named names, 18% were tested in a randomized clinical trial, 17% were not. But if you call it a parachute and they've already been in randomized trials, I think it's pretty close. It's not a parachute. And if you study in a randomized fashion, six were positive, five were negative, five were mixed, which is roughly the breakdown of all randomized trials. So they're really using it lightly. And the absolute risk reductions where we could document, um, you know, go from 30% to 11%, which is great, uh, but it ain't no parachute. And so I guess putting it all together, um, I guess I would say, I, I mean, the way I would summarize it is to say that, um, you know, people have called all sorts of things parachutes uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, but when you actually do have better measures of evidence, you find effect sizes are much more modest. And, and the problem with the modest effect size is that, I mean, it is either bias or it's real. And the way to really tell it apart is, I think, a randomized trial. So I, I totally agree with the premise that you know, there's no randomized trial that, um, you know, if, if you see me at the bus stop and the bus is bearing down on me and you pull me out of the way of the bus, I'm going to credit you for saving my life because I'm probably looking at my phone. But you don't need any study for that. And you, there's never a study that says getting shot in the chest at point blank range is bad for your health. I mean, these things are obvious, but most of what we do, we're in the modest to marginal effect size business. And that's why it's just a business that's ripe for randomization. That's probably why we have more randomized trials than any other profession, I think because we've been in the individual modest to marginal effect size business for a long time. And in the course of human history, I think it's as good as it's ever been. You know, most of history, we were totally wrong and now we're finally getting some things right. So I, I take it. Hi, this has been um, a fantastic oh, gone quick. talk um, and you've really activated uh, the, the uh, participants. Um, who are clearly thinking deeply uh, about what you have presented. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time um, and for all the work you do on behalf of um, keeping medicine and the practice of medicine on track um, and uh, being um, courageous in, in your willingness to call out uh, what you see as something that's not in the best interest of patients and citizens, so thank you. And um, I really hope uh, to see you again uh, here uh, on Zoom and also here in person um, as we had originally intended. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, finish up with a couple uh, uh, slides about our series. And again, thank you very, very much, uh, Vinay. Um, I want to just point out some upcoming talks. Um, we're sort of wrapping up the, uh, the uh, 20, uh, 22 season, uh, 21, 22 season, moving into the 22, 23 season. Uh, we'll have Derek Rossi, co-founder of Moderna, uh, Mihaela Vandeshar, who is uh, an extremely creative uh, force in thinking about uh, open source uh, uh, software, uh, no, I'm sorry, about learning health systems, Karen Copenhaver about open source software, Alan Brandt, um, a celebrated uh, professor uh, of the history of medicine at Harvard University, Richard Miner, inventor of the Android operating system, and uh, Christina Farr, former health tech reporter for CNBC and uh, now health tech uh, investor. 
Um, and uh, thank you very much from uh, uh, the Computational Health Informatics Program. And we hope you will uh, tune in uh, next time as well. Have a terrific rest of your week.